great to be in the house of God today. Are you excited to be in God's house this morning? Praise God. Amen. Can somebody give Jesus a big shout just to show that you are alive today? Okay, man. Come on. Great. And if you're listening to us from home or online, wherever you are, in another city or in the city of KK or even in another nation, we want you to know, just, just like the people on site here right now, you are part and parcel of this great, wonderful family called Skyline. Somebody say an amen. You are highly favoured, greatly blessed and deeply loved. So thank you for taking time, joining us this morning online from wherever you are. We're in for an exciting time. But above all, we're here to honour the Lord Jesus. And that's why we just come before Him in prayer this morning before we start. Let's do that. Father God, we thank you this morning as we come to you. We ask that truly the name of your Son, Jesus, will be honoured. Holy Spirit, please come and assist us. And Lord, just speak into each and every of our hearts this morning so that your word will be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And the entry of your word, together with your spirit, will bring light to God and will transform our lives. We ask all this for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Um, 40 years ago or more, I think, when Pastor Nancy and I were still dating in the, in the city of Oxford, uh, we were walking along and uh, on that particular afternoon, we saw a huge queue just winding its way all the way down a, a, a long street in the city and then snaking around a corner into another street until the end of that other street before it actually ended in the box office of a local cinema. And I think uh, Nancy asked me at that time, you know, what, what's going on here? And I said, you know, this is incredible because uh, I've never seen a queue as long as this in all my student years in the university. And it was already about six, my sixth year in the university. It was, uh, you know, I just graduated or about to graduate, somewhere around there at that point in time. And I said, I've never seen a crowd like that. She says, what's going on? What's going on at the local cinema? I said, well, it is the latest movie. Haven't you heard? It's called Saturday Night Fever, okay. The 1978 great hit that came along with, uh, you know, with, with a PG rating of 18, uh, with strong language, uh, and incredible electrifying disco music, uh, and yet uh, introducing a sensational, dashing young man who not only looked good, but could really move his body and dance in the, man, in the form of John Travolta. And the rest, as they say, is history. That catapulted him uh, to, to stardom. Um, I must confess that I didn't get to watch the movie. Actually, disco movies don't interest me one bit. Uh, so I never saw the movie. Well, actually, I did. Uh, on a long haul flight 30 years later, okay, uh, I saw the movie. So it just tells you about, you know, what I think about the movie. But I would tell you one thing. But the music in Saturday Night Fever captivated me from the moment it hit the charts. Uh, and it has captivated me ever since because uh, most of the music in Saturday Night Fevers was actually provided by an incredible group that somehow had reinvented itself in the 70s, 80s uh, with falsetto voices uh, and provided electrifying music with disco rhythms, with uh, great melodies and stirring, stirring lyrics. I'm talking about the Bee Gees, of course. How many of you have heard the Bee Gees? Can I, about the Bee Gees? Can I see your hands? Come on. Even you younger ones have heard of the Bee Gees. Can I ask one more time? How many of you have heard about the Bee Gees? Have, have heard this name, the Bee Gees? Almost everybody here. They are legendary, okay, the Bee Gees. And uh, if, if you listen to them, you know, these are the groups, this, this was the group that kept my generation, millions of my generation, you know, happy on Saturday night for years and years, decades. Um, but, you know, their music, as I said, are sensational. Um, but there was one song whose lyrics and melody are particularly haunting. And I will tell you about this song. It's called, How Deep Is Your Love? Now, immediately, you see, I, I hear this ripple of laughter and ripple of, wow, excitement. Uh, you all know this song. I won't ask you to sing it. Don't worry. Okay. And the lyrics go like that. How deep is your love? How deep is your love? How deep is your love? I really mean to learn, because we're living in a world of fools, breaking us down. When they all should let us be, we belong to you and me. Na, 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 na. 
No, 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 no. You're all playing it in your mind now, the music. I know, I know. I can, I can see that you're all playing it in your mind. But I will tell you that 2,000 years before the Bee Gees ever came on the scene, before John Travolta ever appeared, before Saturday Night Fever became known, the Apostle Paul addressed exactly the same question to the people he was writing to in the book of Ephesians. He was saying to them, do you know how deep God's love is? And do you know how deep your love is in response? Do you really know? Today, I want to take you back to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. I'm reading from the New King James. It says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He will grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And then he enters into this wonderful you know, crescendo of praise. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The topic of my message today, my message this morning is entitled, How Deep is Deep Love? Deep love is God's love. It's very obvious from the passage. But how deep is deep love? That's the title of my message. This is the last in the series of our Turnaround Prayer series. I don't know whether you've enjoyed the series, whether it's impacted you when it started in January. Now, four months later, just before Easter, on Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday, just in case you didn't know. According to the, the Christian liturgical calendar, it's, it's Palm Sunday. It's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem a week before he went to the cross. Okay? It finishes today on Palm Sunday, one week before Easter. In those four months of turnaround prayers, have you been blessed? Have you been blessed? Many people have uh, told me how much it has helped them during this time. When they've faced devastations, challenges, failures, tragedies in their lives, in their families, diagnoses, accidents, all kinds of things. I've had people come back to see, tell me that it is a turnaround series that's helped them to stand firm and cause them to turn around, you know, their circumstance from their circumstances. So today in the last of the turnaround series, I want to take you through this turnaround prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3. And I want to entitle it, How Deep is Deep Love? Let me start by giving you the first key to understanding how deep is God's deep love for you. Here's the first key. There are three stages in knowing how deep is deep, deep love. The first is this. You may need to move from knowledge to experience. From objective knowledge to subjective experience. That's the first thing that we need to do in order to understand how deep is deep love. Let me ask you a question. How much time do you spend doing research before making a big decision? If you're like most people, probably not much. Do you know on the, you know on the average that most people just visit a car dealership once or at most twice before they buy a new car? They're parting with 50,000, 100,000, 200, 250,000, and they just visit the dealership. They're, they're like, most people I'm talking about, some of you, you know, you're a car enthusiast, you've read every magazine, you know, done every research in the book, but most people just visit a car dealership once or at most twice before actually they, they part with huge sums of money. Not much research. What about visiting doctors? So I've got to be very careful here. I'm a doctor, okay? Most people don't do much research before they visit a doctor. They're just going to ask a family or a friend, oh, you got a bad knee. Oh, I had a bad knee and I visited a doctor. There they go. They don't actually find out from the medical profession who is the expert, who is the good doctor, who has, been, has consistent track records. They don't do research like that. Most people actually have what we know, what science calls a cognitive bias. We just jump to conclusion very quickly 
we just, a cognitive bias is this. If I say, you know, there are red things in this room, immediately you will notice all the red things in this room. Immediately. And suddenly your attention will fix on red things. And for the next five minutes, although you're still listening to me, you're looking for red things. Okay, that's a cognitive bias. And people with cognitive bias, they jump to conclusions. They are what we call jumpers. Turn to your neighbour and say, you're not a jumper. Okay? Now, people jump to conclusions are jumpers because jumpers are people who jump to conclusions very quickly and they're very confident. They're sure they got the right answer. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're quite sure. They jump to conclusions on the sparsest of evidence, but they're quite sure they have the right answer. These are jumpers. Now, medical science uh, has shown us that these jumpers, for example, uh, sometimes need to be challenged. For example, let me give you a problem, a question. A baseball bat and a ball together cost $1.10. Got it? Everybody say amen. Okay, now point number two. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. Okay? Here's the third the question. How much does the ball cost? Five seconds. Okay. The answer is the ball costs five cents. Okay. Most of us immediately thought ten cents. The ball costs ten cents. But if the ball costs ten cents, then the bat must cost one dollar. One dollar minus ten cents is ninety cents. The bat doesn't cost one dollar more than the, the, the ball. Okay, but five cents is the answer. Now, most of us will jump to 10 cents first. Okay, this is called automatic thinking. Automatic thinking is actually quite useful in our evolutionary system because it is automatic thinking that causes us to move and jump to a conclusion uh, without just thinking about it, it may save your life. If you hear a gunshot behind you, you don't turn around and say, what is it, huh? where is it coming from? You just fall flat to the ground or duck, saves your life. If you hear a screeching of a, a car behind you, you don't look around and see where the car coming from. You jump onto the side of the road, into a ditch or whatever, saves your life. Automatic thinking. But automatic thinking is not good for long term. Because when you get into a jumping cognitive bias, you get into a mess. You need reason thinking. Reason thinking is that in the clear light of day, that thinking equilibrates everything. It corrects your automatic thinking. Automatic thinking screams at you that the cost of the ball is 10 cents. If I give you a little bit longer, you would think, and then you realize it is, in, it is obvious. It has to be in the clear light of day. The ball is actually 5 cents cost. That's reason thinking. In reason thinking. So we need both kinds of thinking. Now, let's go back to the Apostle Paul. You say, what has it got to do with Ephesians 3? The Apostle Paul starts Ephesians 3, 3, 14 in his prayer like this. He's praying for all of us. He's praying for the Ephesians. He says, for this reason. Somebody say, for this reason. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth in is named. When somebody say, for this reason, that means... He has been giving the reasons laha, before verse 14 in chapter 3. The whole of chapter 3, and in fact, the whole of chapter 2, and all the verses preceding verse 14, first 13 verses in chapter 3. He's been giving the reasons why he bows his knees to the, bow, bow his knees to the Father he, for this reason. So it's just like if a, a school teacher were to say to you, for, for, to the class, for this reason, I... Ask and I command every one of you to stay back for detention for one hour from tomorrow. For one hour tomorrow. Now, if you walk into the class, you would really want to know what the reason is. I'm sure the teacher didn't say, for this reason, you, all are be, you will have detention class tomorrow. You know, you know just willy-nilly. It's not automatic thinking. It is reason thinking. That is the reason why he's punishing the class. If a young lady in Skyline says to, to, to us, for this reason, I'm going to marry this man. Wow. Then you know that it's not just that the man proposed, but from the time she met this man to the time that he proposed, in that time of meeting and that journey and getting to know the man, he has treated her really well. He's found out many things about him that she really likes and how she, he treasures her and how they get on so well together. And that's why, so you know, while I celebrate the fact that she said yes to his proposal, I want to know what is behind for this reason. 
So when the Apostle Paul says, for this reason, he was actually not into automatic thinking. He was not jumping to cognitive bias. For this reason, eh? you know, no jumping to conclusions. He was uh, articulating reason thinking from deep knowledge. He was giving reason thinking from deep knowledge. The result of this reason, this reason thinking from deep knowledge, what was the result? That was on the Apostle Paul. He said these words. In the New Living Translation, the same passage we read, the Apostle Paul says, when I think of all this, that's what he's saying for this reason, I fall to my knees. I fall. And I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth, I just fall. Then he goes on. And I pray from his glorious unlimited, it just goes on. Resources that He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. That Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. That your roots will grow down deep into love and, in, and, and keep your God's love and keep you strong for this reason. When I think of all this, I fall onto my knees. And then He ends. The same passage in verse 20. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. What is that? That is a psalmody. That is a hymnody. That is a doxology. That is a thanksgiving melody. Something about what He has written before. Verse 14. For this reason has just totally overwhelmed Him. I fall to my knees, He says. And it ends with this, this, this crescendo of praise. To the Lord, you may ask, why such doxology? Why such praise? It is simply because of this principle. When propositional knowledge becomes experiential love, it produces an ending burst of glorious thanksgiving. Listen to me again. When propositional knowledge, objective knowledge, becomes experiential love and experiential truth in our lives, it changes you. It produces unending bursts of glorious thanksgiving. You see, for that young lady who said, yes, for this reason, I'm going to marry this man. What are the propositional knowledge about the man? He, she probably knows. The man, you know, yeah, he comes from a good family. Yeah, he's, he's, had a, he's got a degree. Yeah, he, he's got a stable job. But that's not enough for her to marry him. It's not enough. It is the experiential. When the propositional becomes experiential, the way he treats her, the way he treasures her, the way he looks after her and protects her, the way they get on in the chemistry, when, and he knows that, when she knows that he really loves her, it produces bursts of a glorious thanksgiving. You see, that's the first thing. That's why Paul had this, this response of praise and doxology, because propositional knowledge became experiential love for him. So what was the propositional knowledge? So let me summarize Ephesians 2 and 3 very quickly. What did, was Paul saying? In Ephesians 2, Paul was saying this, we are saved by grace. Somebody say amen. amen. We are saved by grace. When we were hopeless, without hope, in despair, totally under demonic control, we, Jesus snatched us back from the powers of darkness. He set us free from the dominion of Satan. Last time we thought we had freedom. Actually, we didn't have any freedom. We didn't have any freedom. We were just doing what the rest of the world was doing. We were just marching our way to damnation. There was no freedom. We thought we had. We were under the control of the prince of the power of the air, the evil one. We have been snatched back from the powers of darkness, from eternal damnation, set free from the dominion of Satan. He paid the price for our sins. On the cross, He paid that price. And He has now become our peace. We have that peace because He's now our peace. And the walls of division, look at all of us sitting here. And those of you listening to this online, as you're listening together, the walls of division between us has been broken down. Somebody say, Amen. We are one. Somebody say, Amen. God has made us one. Diverse nations, skin, color, whatever backgrounds, we are one. And how do we know He's so real? The Holy Spirit lives in us. His Holy Spirit. We have become His dwelling place. And, and Paul lists all these out in Ephesians 2 and 3. And then he finishes in Ephesians 3. He says, then we Gentiles, because many of the Ephesians were Christians were Gentiles. He says, we Gentiles, we are co-heirs with the Jews in the gospel of grace. 
Last time, you know, the salvation was for the Jews. But now we are co-heirs. We are co-heirs. We, we have untitled to the gospel of grace. This is the manifold wisdom of God only now revealed, he says, to the heavenly hosts and principalities. He says, when this gospel was revealed, that the Gentiles, us, today we can hear the gospel. We can receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. We have access to the throne room of God. He says that this gobsmacked even the angels. The angels couldn't believe it. Heaven couldn't believe it. It's revealed to the heavenly hosts and principalities. They didn't even know it. And then he says, for this reason, when I think of all this, I fall on my knees. Because therein lies a propositional knowledge that gives rise to experiential love. The love of God. But you may say to me, Pastor Philip, how can I really know this? This is all very well. This seems like, you know, how do I know this is not just theological hot air? How do, how do you know this sounds very nice, you know, theologically and very nice sounding uh, poetic terms? But how do I know it's not theological hot air? How do I know it's not wiffle waffle? Well, we know it is not. Because the only religion in which things are based on facts here is Christianity because of the cross. You see, Paul is saying, you look at what the cross has done. This is what he, he says to us. The cross is our reminder. The cross actually happened. There was a man called Jesus. He lived 2,000 years ago. He preached the gospel of salvation. He lived a perfect life. His enemy could not put a finger on him. He was sinless. He was taken to a kangaroo court, falsely accused, crucified. He died a criminal's death. Jesus is a reminder. He died. History tells us this happened. The cross is our reminder. He died a humiliating death for us. How do we know that this, what he did was, was truly valid? Because the resurrection is our proof. And we're coming to Easter Sunday. Somebody say amen. The resurrection is the best attested event that we can have. If we cannot testify to the resurrection, if the resurrection is untrue, if you can pull down the resurrection, I would abandon my faith tomorrow. The resurrection is our proof. Over two, centuries, two millennia of people have tried to pull down the resurrection. There's no better explanation of what's happened up to today. The resurrection is our proof. And then finally, the Holy Spirit is our shared experience. It's no point having something 2,000 years ago and said, that was nice history. Okay, okay, we accept that Jesus died and rose again from the dead after the third day. But, but what's it going to do with us? You know Him. You know He's real. The Holy Spirit is our shared experience. Did somebody say amen? The Holy Spirit lives in you. God's love is in you. You know God is here it's in you. You speak to Him. He talks to you. And that has been the hymnody expressed by people who have moved from propositional knowledge to experiential love through the centuries. Modern day, listen to this. Amazing love. How can it be? We sing this song. That you, my King, should die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honour you in all I do to honour you. Amen. Listen to Isaac Watts. 300 years ago, before, before this, when I surveyed the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and pour contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, there were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. It's the same. Whether it's 300 years ago, whether it's today, amazing love, how can it be? that you, my God, should die for me. So when we move from propositional truths to experiential love, we begin to understand something of God's love, how deep it is. What is this? This is a dragonfly nymph. A dragonfly nymph sits at the bottom of a pond for five years, three to five years. It breathes through the gills just in front of his rectum. Can you imagine that? Your breathing apparatus is just in front of your backside, you know. 
no, no, backside area. And he lives in this kind of existence for three to five years, just eating what he can in mud and slime at the bottom. He never even goes up to the surface of the pond. And then five years later, at night, one night, it goes to the surface of the pond, climbs up a stalk of a reed, and then it molts, and then it becomes a dragonfly. And it flies into the heavens. A dragonfly can never go back to being a nymph. Understand me? Can never. Of course, they're connected because you need to be a nymph first before you can be a dragonfly. But a dragonfly can never go back to being a nymph. A dragonfly can never go back and tell the nymph, there's another world that's far, far better, far superior than that of a nymph life. If you live a propositional knowledge life, that God is just love, that He loves me, sure, I know it's not. That Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And it's just propositional knowledge and propositional truth. It's a nymph existence. Sure, it's connected to an experiential love existence. But once you experience the love, you can never go back to a nymph life. What about you? Do you want that in your life? Can somebody say amen? How many of you, you want to live a life experiencing God's love? Can I see your hands? Those of you online as well, you put it in a chat box, you know, just, I want, I want. And I pray, Father, that in Skyline, all of us will experience God's love. I pray for each one of you today, your hunger for God's love, that you will move from just dry, arid, propositional truth. You'll move from that to dry, arid, propositional truth that has little to do with you. Just so Jesus died for your sins and He loves you, but it's just dry, arid truth. You will move from that to an experiential love. You move from objective knowledge to subjective experience. Somebody say, Amen. Holy Spirit, bring this to pass in Jesus' name. Amen. The second stage of knowing how deep, deep love is, is to move from experience now. You need to move one stage from experience to resilience. Resilience means never giving up. That's what resilience means. Let me give you a picture of a child taken to see a, a, a clinic doctor for the child's vaccination schedule. Okay, the child is highly suspicious. As a two-year-old child, very suspicious of the clinic and new settings. It's like very fretful, very suspicious. But it's you know, it's it sits on the mother's lap, and the nurses try to distract the child because they know what's coming, and try to make the child happy. And then the doctor is preparing his syringe and the vaccine, and then without a warning, he suddenly then gently and quickly lifts up the, the, the child's arm, and then pulls out the sleeve, and then. He injects the child. It is at that moment, suddenly as he injects, there's no response from the child one, no? It just, it's okay. He's shocked. And then immediately after that, he lets out a, you know, a life-taking, piercing scream that fills the whole clinic. Many of you mothers, you know that. You know, and then he tries to whip up his hand away from the, from the doctor. This nasty man, you know. And, it, and at that point in time, he finds the mother is restraining his hand preventing his hand from moving to take the pain away. The mother is allowing him to have the pain. And the pain, he's just fighting against the mother. The mother's allowing him to have the pain. And then the vaccination is done. And then he's like, the mother, my mother, she's meant to protect me. Never cause me pain, never harm. You know, and suddenly there's a trust issue. For a flicker of a second, there's a trust issue. And then what does the child do? As he's crying and screaming, he turns back to the mother. He goes straight back to the mother. Because experiential love produces resilience. You know, those of you who are mothers, you had your child taken to the doctors again and again, not once, but twice or three, four, five times for vaccinations, right? You're taking them back to the same bad, as far as the baby is concerned, the child is concerned, the same bad person who's harming him. You're taking him back. He sees a man, he cries. He sees a doctor, he cries. But every time, he still preaches back to you because he's experienced experiential love. Experientialist produces resilience. He goes back to you. This is very different from many of us because we've only got propositional knowledge. When we have propositional knowledge and we find pain, we run from God. 
we run. We say, God, why? You say you love me. You say you care for me. You say nothing will harm me. You say you take after me. Why? We run. Why? Because we've never experienced true, deep, experiential love from God. We just have a propositional, objective knowledge. And that's how Christianity, a charm, you know, I've got a label. I'm a Christian. I've got a Christian name. I come to church. You know, happening church. I know some happening people here, and I speak the language. But actually, all I know is just this smattering of truth here, that God is good. God loves me. God cares for me. God, I can trust my future to God. That's it. So when pain comes, we will always run from God. See, if you want to know the depth of God's love and to develop resilience, we need to move from experience to resilience. Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 20 again. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, now listen, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. To be strengthened. Somebody say, strengthened. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Somebody say, faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Somebody say, grounded in love. Are you grounded in love? Does Christ dwell in your heart through faith? Are you strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man? Because that's a route to resilience. What's that? Those yellow words there, they're all about resilience. The word used there for strengthen, the Greek word, is not the word dunamis. Dunamis is about power for the short sprint. The word used there for strengthened is the word kratos, which means an inner strength for the really heavy lifting. The lifting that goes mm, and keep going. That's kratos. You see, one of my favorite sports that I watch in the Olympics is weightlifting. I love them. You know, you know even the big women, I love watching them lift the weights. You know, I don't know what they'll do on their wedding night. They will lift their husband across the bride. <laughs> right, but, but, you know. But, but you can see these guys as they're holding this superhuman strength, uh, you know, weight that, that they have. This is really like, it's, un, it's out of this world weight. But you know what? They have to hold it still and wait for the buzzer. If they don't hear the buzzer, they're disqualified. That which doesn't count as a, 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 weight, a, a lift. So they've got to keep it very still. So you can see them. They're lifting it up. They're, it could be one. It's got to be still. Everything, legs, body, hands, still. Two, three seconds. I can tell you, you may think it's three seconds, but the time there is like eternity. It's like flying to the moon and back. It's death. That's Kratos. It's Kratos. God wants to build. Kratos. So when bad things come and you're pushing your back against resistance, you still will not give way. It's kratos. That's the word. That you may be filled, that you may be strengthened with might through your spirit in the inner man. Just a few days ago, Clive and I, we climbed to the summit of Mount Kinabalu. Okay? It's okay. <laughs> Clive for the ninth time and myself for the 26th time. Okay? I thought it would be easy because I climbed. There were two other young men with us, but it was not their time yet, okay? It was the time for the old men, okay? Right? <laughs> but they will make it in their own time, okay? So wow, we, we got up, but you know, having climbed 25 times before, I think it's a piece of cake. I can do it. It was the hardest climb I've ever had. I'm glad to say that Clive said the same thing. Because I thought it was an old man syndrome. He said to him, then, that guy is about 17 years younger than me. He's like, yeah, it's the hardest climb. And I thought to myself, why? I don't understand why. Why was it so hard? The weather was bad, true. The air was very thin, yes. But what's new? Maybe I, I you know, since nine years before when I climbed until now, I've maybe lost a little bit of muscle power, which is almost certainly true. Maybe my hemoglobin, my blood cells have dropped. Maybe that's, you know, a 0.1 or 0.2. Or, and that makes a lot of difference. And maybe that's true. Maybe age is more than just a number. Maybe that's true. <laughs> but Kratos is what got us up there. 
when all the lungs were just crying out in pain and the legs were crying out in pain, every muscle was crying out in pain. What do you do? So I just devised in my head. I just keep going. I just walk. I count a hundred. I count 180 steps. And then I, I Clive was walking. Me, he would. We were counting, but I was counting 180 steps. And then I rest for 60 seconds. 180 seconds. Rest for 60 seconds. I say, Clive, breather. Okay, breather. 60 seconds. <gasps> and then we walk again. <laughs> so after we've succeeded, I tell Clive, you know what? You know, I was counting 180, 60, 180. Do you know that? He said, No, I didn't know. But that's something to do with the way I, I overcome obstacles. My philosophy is very simple. If I can put one foot forward and the next to come, so long as I can put another foot forward, the mountain summit must come and greet me. True? Can true? It has to. That's kratos. That's resilience. Okay? This resilience is not rooted in smugness. I was quite confident because I thought I'd done 25 times before. No, my friends, it humbled me. When I came back, I was so tired. My kids wanted to talk to me on the phone. I was at dinner time. I just wanted to drop my, my face on the plate. <laughs> the resilience is rooted, but the resilience is not rooted in your self-confidence, who you are. Oh, I'm a big time pastor. You know what? You know, I've got ministry for 20 years. You know what? You know, I was under this mentorship by that Principal, that pastor, you know what? I've experienced this. I've done international debt. No, no, no. Kratos must be grounded in love. You must know God's love to have Kratos. You cannot know propositional truth to have Kratos. It won't see you through. You will crack. And then Paul says, I pray that he may grant you with strength to, to, in your inner, inner strength in, to, that, that you may be rooted and grounded that that Christ will dwell in your heart through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the capacity to understand. Then he goes on. The resilience has to be rooted in love and grounded in love and Christ is dwelling in your heart. And every time the heart beats, you know Christ's love is in your heart. Every time it beats, it says, I love you, I love you. Oh, you know it. You know. You know He really loves you. Irrespective of what you've done. That's grace. He still loves you today. I'm saying to some of you now, your condemnation, you're under guilt. He loves you. you got Christ in your heart. The heart of Christ that's beating in you loves you. Can somebody say amen? amen? He will not let you go. Experience His love. Feel His love. Because if you learn to love Him back, it is the growth of your resilience. There's a story told of a heart of a young boy whose mother was illiterate, penniless, very poor, but brought him up the best he could. And he went to graduate school and eventually, you know, succeeded. And he met, a, the, the mother loved him with all her heart. She was, nothing would do for her boy. The boy succeeded, became, you know, very well off, and then met a beautiful girl who was very sophisticated, whom he, you know, fell head over heels in love. And the girl loved him, but he, he, she, she was so jealous of the mother because the boy loved the mother. She says, and the boy said, will you marry me? Will you marry me? The girl says, no, I won't marry you. I only marry you if you give me your mother's heart. If you can prove to me that you love me more than you. But I love you more than my mother. If you truly love me more than my mother. The girl said, I want you to cut out your mother's heart and give it to me. You know what? He was so besotted with, the, with, with his girl. One night, he murdered his mother and cut out the heart. And he was running to her house with a heart through the woods. And as he ran, he stumbled on the tree root and he fell. And the heart was still pumping. And the mother's heart was saying, Son, are you okay? Son, are you okay? Are you okay, son? Are you okay? What you have think you have done against Christ will not stop him loving you. I want you to know that. When you can learn to love Him in return and experience His heartbeat within you, you will experience resilience. But we must want this inner resilience. That's why the Apostle Paul prayed for us that God, He would grant you to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, in the man, that He would grant you. That means if He grants you, you must want it. How do you want it? Do you want it? How many of you want? 
resilience in your life. Lift up your hands if that's what you want. Some may not want, but you must want it. Then God will grant you. If you say, you know what, God, if you want, then grant. If you don't want, okay, can't grant. God wants to grant. But do you want? If you want, He will grant it to you. But even if you don't want resilience, you don't want to know His deep experiential love and build resilience in your life, the same things will happen to you. Because whether you want resilience or you don't want resilience, life will always throw you a curveball. You will have things that upend your life. Both groups. You will have things, you know, that really just gobsmack you, you know, expect them. Blindside you. Events, diagnoses, disasters, tragedies that just totally almost wipe you out. Both, both parties will have it. But if you do not want resilience and all you want is just propositional, objective knowledge of God's love, when you face these problems, this is what you will do. You will grow bitter. You will grow angry with God. And you'll get disenchanted and discouraged. And what will happen is that you will deconstruct your life. You will deconstruct your faith because God doesn't care. I've been there, done that. It doesn't work. You'll deconstruct your faith. But if you grow resilience in your life and, and, and you experience His love and you grow resilience in your life, deep down inside, you, whether you understand it or what you're going through, you believe God is good. God is good all the time, amen? And God is good to me all the time. Just like the baby, he will turn back in the pain and say, Mom is good. Mom is good all the time. And Mom is good to me all the time. Even with the mom has caused him pain again and again and again and again at the doctor's office because experiential love produces resilience. Somebody say amen. How many of you want resilience in your life? One more time, can I ask? Father, I pray that this may be so, that you give us a hunger, Lord, to come to this place, that we will finish the journey well and finish strong. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the final thing, the final stage about knowing how deep is deep love is to move to yieldedness. Yieldedness is the willingness to surrender to God. And with this, I'm going to close very briefly. See, yieldedness is the willingness to surrender to God. Resilience will see you through most things. But there will come a time when you truly need to yield, even though you don't understand. Let me ask you, have you ever wondered what holds the universe together? There are only four forces that hold the whole universe together, including everything that's subatomic, including everything that's microscopic, including germs, including bacteria, virus. Only four forces hold everything that's invisible, so minute to the largest galaxies that we can ever see in the largest suns. Only four forces hold the whole universe together. Gravity, electromagnetic force, weak nuclear force or the force of radioactive decay and strong internuclear force. Only four forces. You know, physics says this. If we truly believe Big Bang took place, that at one point, the universe started from nothing, it started from a point and then boom, it came into being. If that is true, which science says is true, Big Bang took place, then all these four forces, gravity, Electromagnetic, weak and strong in nuclear force were all together one. At, at one point, a point called singularity, they were one. They were all joined together. And for the last 90 years since Einstein tried to do it, everyone has been trying to find, find a theorem or an equation to unite all these four forces. They have not been able to do it up to today. There's no theorem. Quantum mechanics will unite electromagnetic, weak and strong nuclear force. Gravity is described by relativity, but quantum mechanics and gravity cannot mix. They cannot be unified into a single equation. That is the present problem of physics. They're trying and trying and they're thinking, maybe all our physics is wrong. And then they have an astounding discovery in the last 15 years. Then they look at the universe and discover that most of the universe, energy and matter, they cannot see. 
74% of the universe is made out of dark energy, which is causing the universe to expand and accelerate. 21% is made out of dark uh, matter, which causes the galaxies to hold together. In other words, the four forces that hold the whole universe together holds only the seen universe, the seen universe, what we can see. In other words, the four fundamental forces of physics that holds the whole universe together holds the 4%. That's what we can see. What holds the other 21%, 74%? Nobody knows. We only discovered it recently. This is astounding. What does cosmology tell us? When you look at the stars at night, it tells us one thing. The more you know, the more you know, you don't know. That's it. And Paul says that it's exactly like the love of God. Maybe that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. See, Paul uses mathematics to quantify God's love. Length, breadth, height, and depth. Hey, that's an oxymoron. How can you quantify love, God's love with? He's trying, for goodness sake, he's trying to quantify. He's, 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 just, he's just losing track. You know, you can't quantify love. For example, you, if you tell your wife, today I give you three pounds of hugs. Tomorrow, two ounces of kisses. And then and the following day, I'll give you, you know, three kilos of love. Your love, your wife will just give you, you know, two tight slaps or whatever. <laughs> Don't talk this rubbish to me. Don't talk this rubbish. It's an oxymoron. You can't say these things. That's what Paul is trying to do. Height, length, depth. How you can describe love? It's an oxymoron. Just like a woman who went to a weighing machine. He went to a supermarket. And this weighing machine was a weighing machine that weighing scales that would tell her your, uh, your fortune as well as your weight. So as her husband waited, she put a coin in, into the weighing machine. And pop, out pop her card. You know, with a fortune and weight. She looked at the card, the, the card and she says, Darling, this is what it says. My fortune, you are an attractive woman. Vivacious, slim, beautiful. You have a fantastic personality. And you are a great cook. Show me the card. The, word, the husband said, Took, Alamah said the card. Said the, the, the husband, they also got the weight wrong. The weight was also wrong, he says. It's an oxymoron to try to measure God's love. Why then did God, did Paul try to measure God's love? Because God's love is so vast and so counterintuitive to ours. Here's the point. The mother holds the child. The doctor is hurting. As far as the child, child is concerned, that doctor, is a, that man is a bad man. Not only hurt once, but again and again and again. And the mother allows that. It's so counterintuitive to ours. Why? Because His love is so vast. It's so counterintuitive. What do we really do in situations where we are really lost about God's love? There's only one answer. Where there's no resilience left. Have you been times like that? You face a diagnosis, you don't know what to do. You face a tragedy, you blaze a situation, you don't know what to do. You don't really don't know what to do. You know, you're... you're there's no resilience left. There's no strength left. You're so devastated. You don't even understand where, where God is. What have you got left? Only one thing. It's yieldedness. What is yieldedness? To understand how deep God's love is, this is the final stage. It's yieldedness. This is what Paul says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Paul is saying, when you don't understand, remember this. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Just surrender to me that. Just surrender to Him. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can think. Yes, it's a devastation now, but He's able. Just believe that. He's a good God. According to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. You see, yieldedness is something that we must hold on this side of heaven until we see Jesus again. What's the difference between resilience and yieldedness? Yieldedness is surrendering to God because we really don't understand. We don't have any strength left. It is this. I'll give you seven quick differences and with that, I'll close. Very quick, okay? Just get, whatever it is, get ready. You can listen to it again. In the, in the, but resilience 
See, resilience for us. God wants resilience for us. For what? Resilience is good for tough times. Somebody say amen. Yieldedness is good for tougher times. Secondly, resilience is when we seek answers. Yieldedness is when answers don't work. Resilience is when we are in control. Yieldedness is when, God, you are in control. Resilience is centers on who we are. God, you know, you said this to me. Why is it happening to me? Yieldedness focuses on whose we are. Resilience, we seek to regain lost ground. In yieldedness, we accept our losses and embrace new ground. That's the power. And here's the sixth one. In resilience, we cultivate the mastery of our circumstances. We're in control. But in yieldedness, we cultivate the mystery of God. And in resilience, we push on. But in yieldedness, we pray on. All heads bowed, all eyes closed right now. Because God is asking, now you know how deep is my love for you. How deep is your deep love? Because if you grow in these three areas, you will grow to love God very deeply. You must move, we must all move from knowledge to experience. Propositional knowledge to subjective experience. We must move from experience to inner resilience. And we must move from resilience to yieldedness. So long as we are alive on this planet Earth before we see Jesus, we will have to balance resilience with yieldedness. Sometimes we will need resilience. Sometimes we will need yieldedness. Not always yieldedness, not always resilience, but we need to balance the two until we see Jesus face to face. But when we take this journey, then God can say to us, I see you growing in love. And that love is deep love. You're learning about the quality of my love. All heads bowed, all eyes closed as I pray right now. If there's any one of you, you, want, you have not known God's love, but today you want, you want to know God's love. And, that, and, and this, this, this day, as you want to open your heart to Jesus, you want to know God's love, God's love is only found in Jesus on the cross. If today you want to receive Jesus into your heart, right now where you are, whether you're at home listening to me or whether you are here in this auditorium, can you pray a simple prayer with me to commit your life to Jesus and to receive God's love? If you've never done it before, pray this prayer. Say, Father God, thank you that you love me. Today I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you love me so much. I open the door of my heart. I ask you to come into my life as my Lord, my Savior, my Master. From this day, Lord, I receive your love. I want to know and grow to love you more deeply in my life. Teach me how. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, it's fantastic. There's a QR code for you to scan if you're online. You know, if you're here as well, there's a QR code for you to scan. We would love to get in touch with you. We want to give you some resources to help you, to bless you, so that you can really enjoy walking with Jesus and being part of His family of God. Now I'm going to ask every one of us to stand as I close in prayer for each and every one of us. Father, thank You for Your Word. Your Word brings light. And I pray today that, Lord, what we have discovered, what we have learned, it will be a great blessing to us. And Lord, we pray that this church will be a resilient church. This church, oh God, will be a church that is totally surrendered to you. This church will not be a church just with full of knowledge, head knowledge. Yes, it is important. We must understand the truths and the knowledge, but we must go beyond. So Father, as we open our hearts right now, we want to rededicate our lives to you that, Lord, we want to finish strong, we want to finish well, and, we, Lord, we want to know your deep love even more 
and grow in a deeper love for you. We ask this all in Jesus' name and all God's wonderful people said, Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor, for really reminding us to deepen our head knowledge. To yeah, you can be to deepen our. You can be seated now, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah. To deepen our head knowledge in experiential love, inner resilience, and really just peaceful yieldedness. I, I believe you're all so blessed by it. And that's right, guys. You know, um, if you online or on site just surrendered your life to Jesus or maybe reinvited him into your life hey we want to congratulate and celebrate you along with the heavens all right so help us to do that by just taking a few seconds more to scan this QR code on screen right now all right we just want to provide you with practical materials and support along this beautiful journey ahead Amen, amen. And for the rest of us, Skyline family, let's connect. Let's connect, you know. If you guys ever need us to stand with you in prayers, or maybe you have a joy you want to share with us, or to testify the goodness of the Lord in your life to encourage us, or maybe you're here for the first few times and you don't know who or what Skyline is, you know, you can do all of that on screen right now with this all right, or you can just visit skylightsb.com, right? And you know, as we come to close to the service this morning, can I just invite everyone to be uprising again and allow me to bless you for your week ahead? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, wow. Lord, thank you for speaking and working in us, not just on a Sunday like this, but Father, draw our Mondays to Saturdays. Lord, we pray for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the love of God and we pray for the, whole, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be each and every one of us in our lives every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you guys. God bless you.